Hello everyone and thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Meg Drexler and along with my colleagues here at Community Business Bureau, I'm delighted to welcome you to ILC Ready, uh, our new program for community organisations who want to build their skills in planning projects and applying for funding. And this is our last in a series of three webinars. Uh, thanks to funding from South Australia's Department of Human Services through its NDIA Community Inclusion and Capacity Development Grant, the ILC Ready program is free. Joining us today, we have people from all different kinds of organisations. We have some experienced grant applicants and people who've never done a grant application before. This webinar and our whole ILC Ready program is for all of you. If you are experienced, some of the information we present today might be familiar. Uh, do stick around because we'll share some new stuff too and you'll have the chance to share your experience in our interactive Q&A. Before we get started, I'm going to share some tips to help you get the most out of the ILC Ready program and today's webinar. This is the last in a series of three webinars. You can catch up on the first two webinars in the series on our website, cbb.com.au forward slash ILC. Still to come in the program, a full day live workshop is touring South Australia next month and there is the opportunity now open for South Australian organisations to apply for individual support from a CBB consultant to develop your proposal ready for a future ILC grant round. A bit more on that later. If you know anyone else who'd like to join us, please feel free to share our website with them too. This is an interactive program so the more people get involved, the more we'll be able to learn together and from each other too. On your screen, you'll see some tools that will allow you to interact with me and the other people attending today. At any time, you can write a message in the chat window that's at the right-hand side of your screen. That will be seen by everyone and will also be viewable on a recording of this webinar that will be available right at the end of today and also published on our website. If you don't see that chat window, just click in the bottom right hand corner and it will pop up. My colleague Kirsten Tate is moderating the chat today. Hi Kirsten. Morning. <laughs> so if you have any technical questions, you can write a message to Kirsten in that chat window at any time. You can also post a question. There are two ways to do this. Click or tap on questions at the bottom of your screen to see the questions that have been posted. You can vote for your favourites or add your own. If there's something in the chat you want to add as a question, then hover or your mouse and tap on the message in the chat window and click the question mark. If email is more accessible for you, you can also email ILC at cbb.com.au Kirsten is watching our inbox and will be able to see your response and uh, post it for you. We'll answer as many questions as we can in about 45 minutes time when we start our live Q&A. Joining me today will be Sue Horsnell, CEO of HCO uh, and one of the case studies that um, we'll be sharing with you today as well. Before you leave today, please share your feedback by clicking on polls at the bottom of, your, of the screen. So I hope you enjoy today. Uh, and remember to get out of the most asked questions and vote for your favorites. Today, we'll be going through step-by-step -step the process of planning, applying for, and delivering an ILC grant funded project. First, we'll touch on designing a project for impact. Then we'll look at how to plan the activities you'll do and the resources you need as well as different kinds of collaboration, such as auspicing. We'll tour the Community Grants Hub, which is where you apply for an ILC grant, show you how to assess a grant requirements document so that you can decide if it's the right opportunity for you, and share some hot tips for writing your application. We'll also look at what's involved in actually delivering a project once you've won a grant. Throughout today, we'll be sharing real life experiences from organisations that are already running their own ILC projects. Finally, at the end, uh, we'll introduce you to the consultants that you'll meet at our free workshops and answer your questions about how you can apply for one-to-one -one support to develop your ILC idea. 
So let's get started with designing your project. The ILC grant programs offer so many opportunities for our communities and also for the organisations that take part. The ILC is part of the National Disability Strategy. Its vision is an inclusive Australian society that enables people with disability to fulfil their potential as equal citizens. If you also believe in this vision, then the very first step in developing an ILC project is to get inspired. You can do that by looking around at what's happening in your community to find an unmet need or a problem that needs solving. In our previous webinars, we've seen how different ILC projects are addressing needs in their communities. We saw examples of how organisations of all kinds and sizes are using ILC funding to keep a good thing going or extend a program to reach more people. We saw projects that are doing something small that nonetheless makes quite a big impact. Um, we've seen projects that will help people with disability who won't have an NDIS plan. Different ways that people are creating opportunities for people with disability to get involved and make the changes that need to happen in the community so that it's more inclusive. And there are even some ILC projects that are helping people with very specific needs. So have a look around and maybe watch our previous webinars. The next step is to design a project that meets outcomes. To be eligible for an ILC grant, your project needs to align with one of four ILC outcomes. They're different for each ILC grant program. Those grant programs, again, are the Individual Capacity Building Program. That funds peer support and other projects to help build the knowledge, skills and confidence of people with disability to participate in the community. The National Information Program is aiming to create nationally consistent information about disabilities so that people with disability have the information they need to make informed choices. The Mainstream Capacity Building Program, its outcome is to make sure that people with disability benefit from the same mainstream services we all use, like health and education. And the Economic and Community Participation Program is looking for the outcome that people with disability can benefit from the same employment and community activities as everyone else. You can learn more about these four ILC grant programs and some of the projects already making an impact in these areas in our first webinars, ILC The Big Picture and Making an Impact Your ILC Opportunity. Again, recordings of those are available on our website. So you've been inspired, you've found a need and you have a project idea to meet one of those outcomes. The next thing you need to do is to design the activities you'll need to do that will, that will get you there. In our second webinar, we looked at the general investment principles that guide the four ILC programs. Across all of the programs, the NDIA is looking for projects that are evidence-based wherever possible, meaning that they answer a real need using a solution that's likely to work. They're looking for projects that are led by and for people with disability and their families that are replicable and scalable, meaning they're ideas with legs that could be used in different places or made bigger over time. They're looking for activities that support a sustainable NDIS, meaning that the projects help prevent people needing specialised support from an NDIS plan. For example, making mainstream services better. They're also looking for projects that help important groups like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people from different cultural backgrounds, people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex or questioning, or people in regional and remote areas. Which of these principles is the most important will vary depending on the requirements of each grant round. This brings us to our first hot tip. When designing your project, identify your strengths and build on them. You don't need to be an NDIS provider to go for an ILC grant or even work in the disability sector. You might have a special skill that can make a difference. Here's an example. The Australian Migrant Resource Centre is a user-led organisation helping newly arrived migrants settle into life in Australia. They are governed by new and emerging migrant communities and also staffed by people from those communities. 
Before the ILC, they didn't have much understanding of the disability sector other than providing direct referral. Their ILC project was one of the first funded back in 2017. The idea came about by listening to people in new and emerging migrant communities. At an ethnic leaders forum, the Australian Migrant Resource Centre were reminded that refugees arriving in the 90s, 2000s and now are dealing with issues related to disability, often alongside the challenges of settlement in a new country. Many of those migrants had injuries that were becoming more difficult with age. Many were also arriving with injuries and finding pathways to assessment and support difficult to access. So the Australian Migrant Resource Centre applied for ILC funding to train its staff to better understand the disability supports available. They have become messengers in their own communities, helping people with disability, their families and carers to better understand disability and reduce stigma, to find out what's available to them and pathways to access services and build their confidence to engage with disability services. All of that in their own language and in a way that's culturally safe. The training resources that have been developed through that ILC funding are now part of the Australian Migrant Resource Centre's usual policies and service planning. They've also shared their resource with mainstream providers through a series of workshops. They've published a handbook and are doing ongoing forums to link migrant communities with service providers. In the picture that's on the screen now, you can see some of the Australian Migrant Resource Centre stakeholders at the launch of that handbook. It's called Culturally Responsive Services, a resource for NDIS service providers. So the outcome of this project is that by having informed family members and workers, that will mean that people with disability in migrant communities are no longer alone. Another benefit is that as well as individual outreach into those communities, the community groups themselves have learnt from each other about ways to include people of all abilities by providing forums for their input into decision making and engaging them with um, others in specific sectors. Now, work in this area is far from finished. There will be more to do as the profile of new arrivals changes, as management committees of different community organisations change, and as the sector personnel change uh, and the National Disability Insurance Scheme continues to mature. So for the Australian Migrant Resource Centre, using ILC funding has created opportunities beyond the initial project as well. The Launch Into Work project has now got five trained and accredited staff working directly with clients uh, through the NDIS. And this year, the Australian Migrant Resource Centre also started another project called Test, Try and Learn. They're recruiting and training 80 women to become qualified support workers and gain work experience and employment in the disability sector. You can find out more about those initiatives at the link Kirsten's posting now. So you've now heard how the Australian Migrant Resource Centre has used its strengths to make a difference. Our hot tip again, take some time to reflect on your strengths as an organisation. What do you do best of all? And how could that strength help achieve one of the ILC's outcomes? This will help you find an opportunity and that's the start of a great ILC project. Now onto planning. Once you have a great idea, you need to work out what you'll need to do to bring that idea to life. First, you'll want to work out the kinds of activities you'll need to do. Our workshops will help you do just that. And we'll tell you a bit more about them at the end of today's webinar. They are open for bookings now. Once you have your list of activities, you'll need to think about how you can deliver them. And that means assessing your resources. Excuse me. So assessing your resources, you'll need to think about both your capacity or how much effort you're going to spend in time and money and your capability. 
do you have the skills and knowledge to do this? If you have enough of both, you can deliver the activity yourself. If you have capability, but not enough time or money, you might look for funds to grow the resources you already have. For example, you could hire a project manager as part of your grant. If you don't have skills or the capacity to do something, you could think about outsourcing delivery of one activity to a partner or budget for some professional help. For example, you could hire a media production company to make a video. Maybe you have the time to do something, but you don't have the capability to do it yourself. You might hire in an expert to help you deliver part of your project and build your team's capability at the same time. This is how CBB's consultants work. Now here's some real life learning about resourcing. HCO's ILC grant was to extend its successful neighbourhood links program to new geographic areas. At the time, HCO's existing clients were in the process of transitioning from block funding to individually funded NDIS plans. Neighbourhood Links was block funded and that would be ending soon. HCO realised that the peer-based Neighbourhood Links model wouldn't fit into the NDIS funded supports. So being keen to keep this successful program running, they jumped at the chance to not only keep it going, but also extend its reach through their ILC grant. While they didn't need to start from scratch, there was a lot of work involved in growing the program at the same time as transitioning their core services to the NDIS. We're going to talk to Sue, the CEO of HCO today, about her experience. So if you have any questions for Sue, feel free to add them to the questions now. Her advice when it comes to resourcing, make sure you budget for the cost of starting your new program. That might include promoting the program to attract participants or hiring extra people to manage the program, especially in its initial stages. Depending on the rules of the grant round that you're applying for, these are both costs that could be included in your grant funded budget. You will only be able to claim the cost of staff who are working on your ILC project and you can't use ILC grant money to fund services you already get paid for through NDIS plans. If like Sue, you're an NDIS provider, consider what parts of your ILC project need dedicated staff and what you can contribute from your own staff pool without generating any conflict of interest. By looking at your resources, you're going to find some things you can do and other areas where you'll need to team up with others. You can get help by hiring contractors, applying for a grant together with other organisations who have similar aims in a consortium or less formal kinds of collaboration. We talked about this in webinar two. Today, we're going to look a bit more closely at auspicing. Now, in some ILC grant programs, like the Individual Capacity Building Program, the NDIA will look for applications specifically from organisations led by and for people with disability or priority groups. Some of these groups might be unincorporated organisations. Our next hot tip is for you. If you're a community-based group and not a legal entity in your own right, you can apply for an ILC grant by working with an auspicer. An auspicer is a separate organisation who manages the grant money and sometimes offers other practical support for the group delivering, delivering the ILC project. Here's a great example. Disability Elders of All Ages is a peer support group run by and for people with a physical disability. They were formed in 2015 to provide mutual support and share ideas with others who have similar experiences. The idea was to share your wisdom and experience no matter your age. The second group that we're going to talk about, JFY or Julia Far Youth, has been going since 2008. They're a group of young people living with disability who advocate and advise on issues related to young people and disability. They also run a peer network and mentoring round, mentoring program, beg my pardon. Both of these organisations have won ILC grants under 
the DPFO or Disabled Peoples and Family Organisations round that was announced earlier this year. JFY are going to use their funds to hire expect expertise to help them become incorporated in their own right and recruit an executive officer to support JFY's initiatives. Disability elders are using their grant to pay for a project officer who's supporting the group to develop and train a team of peer connectors. These leaders will share knowledge and experience in self-management and self-directed supports. Both of these groups are auspiced by JFA Purple Orange, a much larger incorporated social profit organisation. Purple Orange are on a mission to create a world where people who live with disability have a fair go at what life has to offer. They listen to, learn from and work alongside people who live with disability to develop policy and practice that makes a difference. Now, unincorporated entities can't hire staff. So as well as managing the grant funds, as auspicer, Purple Orange also provides staff that are funded by the ILC grants. One of those staff members is Catherine Mills, the Project Officer for Disability Elders of All Ages. Catherine spoke with us and let us know that um, although Purple Orange is providing resources for disability elders, the disability elders retain control of their project. If you're thinking about auspicing, think about it as an opportunity to mentor and support a growing organisation. The end aim, to grow their independence. Supporting user-led and peer support organisations in this way is part of Purple Orange's strategic direction. And they already had provided some in-kind support to help the disability elders get started. With auspicing, that's allowed both groups to hire the staff they need to grow and to develop independence. Last but not least in your plan, your budget. To build your budget, you'll need to know what your activities will cost. Decide what you can fund yourself and what can be funded through the specific ILC grant you're applying for. It's really important to ask for the right amount of funding because once your grant is agreed, you won't be able to get extra funds. Two more hot tips here. One, always work with GST exclusive figures. The community grant system where you lodge your application will automatically add GST if you're GST registered. If you want to build in CPI increases, make sure you factor that into your costs as well. So now you have designed your idea, you've planned, and a new ILC grant round has just been announced. Woohoo! You're going to have about four weeks to read and understand the grant requirements, draft your response, get feedback from any partners and stakeholders. Stakeholders are people involved in or impacted by your project. Review it to see if the opportunity is right for you. Refine and edit your response to answer the grant requirements within the word limits. And finally, submit your application. Then later on, if you've won, you'll need to be prepared to deliver. Whew. I bet you're glad you had your project idea ready to go now, aren't you? Let's take these one at a time. First, another hot tip. With applying, make sure that you know when an ILC grant is released or awarded by signing up to the NDIA's ILC newsletter. Kirsten is posting a link to that now, or you can just search ILC on ndis.gov.au website. Once a grant opportunity is released, the Department of Social Services' Community Grants Hub is the place to go to learn about and apply for the grant. We're going to head on over to the Grants Hub now and show you around. But before we do, a note of caution. The information in today's webinar is general in nature and is not official advice from the NDIA or the Community Grants Hub. If you are going to apply for a grant, be sure to read the requirements in the official documents. If you have some general questions about RC grants, that's fine. Feel free to post them in the questions. And if we can't answer them in today's Q&A, we'll forward them to the NDIA for you. If you have questions about a current grant, you can ask those at the Community Grants Hub. So let's have a look. 
You find the Community Grants Hub at www.communitygrants.gov.au. It's a good idea to subscribe to this website as well as the NDIA's ILC list. The Community Grants Hub has ILC grants as well as other community grants. If you scroll down to the bottom, you can subscribe for updates or when there's been changes to existing grants. Back at the top of the page, search for grants, put in ILC, and you'll get a list of all the past and current ILC grants. We're going to unpack the Disabled Peoples and Families Organisation's ILC Readiness Grant Round to show you the information that's included. The top of the page for each grant tells you the status of the grant round, if it's open or closed. This round closed in December. The closing date and time is when you need to have your application submitted by. You can see what areas the grant is for. This one was available nationally. And the selection process tells you about how the grant will be awarded. The selection process can be open or restricted. Open means that anyone eligible can apply. Open processes are advertised through the media, the Hub website, Grant Connect and other places to attract as much interest as possible. Restricted grants are targeted to specific organisations who are directly invited to apply. This selection process is used when there are few providers available to deliver activities in the grant or there's time constraints. The selection process might also be competitive or non-competitive. In a competitive selection process, grants have an open and closed date and applications are assessed against set selection criteria. In a non-competitive process, applications are assessed against the selection criteria individually, not compared with other applications. Sometimes grants can be one-off. They're designed to meet a specific need often urgent or special circumstances. One of grants won't have a planned selection process and won't be on this website. Scrolling down, you'll find a summary of the objectives of the grant and a whole lot of information about who's eligible to apply. For the full details of the grant though, you need to scroll down further to download and read the grant opportunity documents. The grant opportunity guidelines are the key document to read along with the questions and answers. They'll tell you everything you need to know to apply for the grant. Sometimes these are available in easy English too. The grant conditions and supplementary terms are examples of the types of legal terms and conditions you can expect to see in a grant agreement if you're successful. Reading these will make sure you're informed of what would be expected if you get the grant. If you have any questions, you can ring the Community Grants Hub hotline. Sometimes there's also a sample grant agreement here as well. Finally, there might be some templates to use in your application. To apply for this grant, applicants needed to set out their project's budget in a specific way. That's what the template is for. If they were applying with another organisation acting as auspicer, there was a template for that too you can save yourself a lot of time later in the process by looking at all of these documents right at the start. It's important to be comfortable with the terms and conditions so you don't get a surprise when you're successful and it's time to sign your agreement. And any templates will make sure you've included the information that's needed to make the process of putting your application together faster. When you're ready, you can start your grant application by clicking apply just below the grant opportunity documents. After the grant has been awarded, if you weren't successful, you'll be able to read feedback from the team who assessed all the grants. You'll find that above the grant opportunity documents. Let's look inside the requirements document itself. There are a few key areas to look at that will help you decide if this grant is the right fit for your project and your organisation. The introduction will tell you about the process by which the grant will be awarded and some general information about the aims of that grant. There will be details about the grant amount, how long it will go for, if there's a maximum amount and how many grants will be awarded. 
that can give you an idea of the average sort of grant size. Eligibility will tell you who can apply and how. This part also often tells you the sort of capabilities that applicants are expected to have. The guidelines will say what kind of activities it will fund and what the money can and can't be used for. It will also set out the selection criteria that will be used to assess your application and might also have directions about what you need to include in your response. Finally, it will also set out what will be expected when you win the grant, fingers crossed. So if you're eligible and your project fits with the sort of activities the grant is looking for, the next step is to draft a response. This doesn't have to be detailed. Simply for each criteria, jot down what's required, how your project meets this, what evidence you might you have or could get to prove it. And it's a good idea to get feedback from your stakeholders here as well. They might suggest ways you can make your evidence stronger by adding or removing information. Then review what you've got. You should have a good picture of whether this grant is right for your project. If it's not, perhaps it could be with some changes or with help from others, or you could look for other sources of funding. If you think the grant is a good fit for your project, go back and read the document again in detail. Then start refining your writing. It doesn't need to be poetic, just concise, clear, and full of evidence that your project meets the grant requirements. Finally, persist. Disability elders applied for funding from different sources a few times before they were successful, so don't give up. The Community Grants Hub has more hot tips. You can click on information for a range of fact sheets to help you with topics like how to prepare strong evidence, the sort of financial information you need, the processes that will help you manage your grant and resourcing your project. You can also contact the Community Grants Hub for help on their hotline, which is 1800 020 283. So now you've clicked submit on the Community Grants Hub and your application is on its way. It'll be seen by a few different people. First, the team at the Community Grants Hub gets your application, checks that you're eligible and assesses your application against the selection criteria. Applications that meet the criteria get passed on to the selection advisory panel. They make recommendations to the delegate about which applicants should be awarded funding, how much, and with what conditions. The delegate is the person who makes the final decision. Successful applicants are told, and the Community Grants Hub enters the decision into their system. From there, grant agreements are created, and the draft agreement is checked and a final agreement goes to you with a formal grant offer. Now, the deadline for you to sign and return that agreement can be as little as 10 to 30 days. If you don't respond in time, the offer will lapse. So to make sure you get your grant, read all the documents on the Community Grants Hub. Check your email. The contact person that you nominate can't be changed once you've put your application in. So if you're waiting to hear about a grant, make sure that the contact person's email address is monitored. Can you imagine how awful it would be to get back from a holiday and realise that you'd missed out on a grant because you missed an email? Oh, the horror. It's probably a good idea to add the ndis.gov.au domain to your safe emails too. Let's assume that that hasn't happened to you. You signed your grant agreement, sent it back, and now the NDIA signs and dates the agreement. The day that that happens is your contract's official start date. You can only claim expenses for grant activities made after that start date. You'll then meet your ILC grant manager who will be with you throughout your project. They'll send you a copy of the executed grant agreement and give you a template to complete your work plan. The work plan sets out what you'll be doing and when in delivering your grant. You'll have six weeks to put your work plan together and start delivering your grant. So let's have a look at what's involved in managing your ILC project. Your ILC grant manager will be working with you to make sure the investment made in your grant delivers outcomes. 
you'll give them regular reports on how things are going. And as you'll manage your project, they're your go-to person if you have any questions about how to work within the terms of your grant. Now, your work plan will be different depending on the grant. It's all templated, so it's not difficult to write. It will include things like project plan. A project plan is a table that shows the activities you'll do in your project. Each activity has deliverables. They're the things that you'll provide as part of that activity. For example, let's say creating a peer-led advisory group is one of your activities. Your deliverables might be advertising to find participants, holding your first meeting and publicising its outcomes. For each deliverable, there will be how it will done, be done, a start and a finish date. For example, for your meeting, you might need to say who will be invited and where it will be. Also in the work plan, there will be KPIs, key performance indicators for you to use in your progress reports. As well as the project plan, you might have a stakeholder engagement plan. This records who your stakeholders are, what your relationship is, and what you're going to do to engage them throughout your project. For each activity, you'll put in a progress report about how many, who, how much was delivered, and the status of each deliverable, whether it's started, in progress, or finished. So that's the work plan and the reporting that you can expect. Remember, you will be given a template to use by your grant manager, so you won't need to create this yourself, just provide regular reports. Now, let's look at how one organisation is managing delivery of its ILC project. As well as auspicing the disability elders of all ages, Purple Orange runs its own ILC project, Inclusive School Communities. It aims to make mainstream primary and secondary schools more accessible and inclusive for children with disability and their families. People living with disability co-design and co-deliver the project activities. In the project, school leaders already using inclusive practices join up with inclusive school mentors to form a community of practice. The mentors are young people living with disability. They bring their experience to help the school leaders reflect on and improve policy and practices that support diversity and inclusion. Over time, the communities of practice will identify practices that work to build inclusion for learning, for culture and for leadership. These will be made up into an inclusive schools toolkit that will be always growing and accessible to all schools to help inclusive practices spread. The first community of practice is already in operation with five schools meeting regularly to discuss and develop inclusive school practices. This first group will help influence and inspire a second cohort of schools. And Purple Orange is recruiting seven schools for that second cohort now. We'll talk more with Letitia Rose, Inclusive Schools Project Leader, in our live Q&A on the 5th of August. One of her hot tips for delivering an ILC project, keep your eyes on the ball and be ready to pivot. Things can change. So in order to meet the outcomes you'd intended, you might need to change your work plan. As long as you're still using funds for the purpose agreed in your grant to meet the project outcomes, this is often okay. Just check with your NDIS grant manager. For example, Purple Orange originally planned to have one school leader and one student rep attend each community of practice meeting, but they found in practice that schools had difficulty sourcing a suitable student to go along. So they had to think creatively about other ways to meet their objective to strengthen student voice that would work for each school. Purple Orange now has two school leaders from each school attending community of practice meetings and they're also working with individual schools to support involvement and leadership of students in their school's development of inclusive practices. Letitia's second hot tip, build learning into your project. While you'll need to show how you'll measure and evaluate your project in your grant application, the actual design of your research questions themselves can be best worked out once your project is running. For example, Purple Orange's application said which activities and outcomes they'd be measuring, 
and gave examples of the types of quantitative and qualitative data they'd collect to measure what outcomes and outputs. But the actual design of the research, like the questions they'd ask, for example, has been informed by what they've learned while running the project. As well as collecting their own learning, Purple Orange decided to appoint a consultant to act as their overall project evaluator for two reasons, workload, and also to provide an independent view. An independent evaluation is a good approach to assess your project's success. It can be helpful if you might want to continue or expand your project beyond your ILC grant. If you think you might want an independent evaluation for your project, build it into your budget. So, you can learn a lot while your project is running. Your project may be simple or it might have lots of moving parts. Good organisation is important and so are your relationships with your stakeholders. At the end of the day, project management is about relationships. Relationships between activities and outcomes, inputs and outputs, and all of these are delivered by people. This brings us to our next hot tip. Take care of your stakeholders and your project will run more smoothly. That is especially important when engaging with many different groups. As well as being organised, good project management means having good interpersonal skills, the ability to mediate and to negotiate change. Now, on the Thursday repeat of this webinar, we'll be talking to Catherine Mills, the Project Lead Officer for the Disability of All Ages ILC project. Catherine sees her role as a facilitator, not the boss. The disability elders retain full power in and ownership of decision-making for their project, while she keeps the project and its deliverables on track towards the outcome. As part of this, Catherine brokers the relationship between the disability elders and Purple Orange. The two organisations started their relationship with a shared vision, and now Catherine works to keep communication open and maintain a strong relationship as the project develops. It's also vital to recognise the contribution of all stakeholders make to the success of the project. That might simply be acknowledgement, but it can also be financial. Remember, there's a world of difference between asking someone their quick opinion, for example, by filling out a survey, and asking someone to provide significant time and expertise. People with disability are often asked to do a lot for free. Here's another hot tip. If you are involving people with disability in the co-design and delivery of your project, in fact, in any job that would otherwise be paid, then pay them. Both Purple Orange and SACID are doing this with their ILC projects. You might find great talent among your stakeholders and you'll be helping people with disability move from voluntary work to paid roles. So, now we're near the end of today's session. One final hot tip, team up with others and skill up if you need to. With a good project idea, strong planning and the right opportunity, you could succeed at running an ILC project. And we're here to help you. Whether you're experienced or just starting out with your first grant, coming along to our workshops will allow you to meet others in your area who also want to make a more inclusive community. Develop your idea and leave with an action plan of things for you to do to get ready for future grant rounds. You'll also then be ready to apply for one-to-one -one support to develop your idea. 20 organisations will be granted free support from a CBB consultant and applications are open now. ILC Ready is funded by the South Australia's Department of Human Services through its NDIA Community Inclusion and Capacity Development Grant, which means that the webinar series and workshop is free for anyone to access. Now it's time for our live Q&A. Joining us today, we have Sue Horsnell from HCO. Uh, after, hi. hi, Sue. How are you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, after I've spoken with you, Sue, we will also be answering any questions you might have about our workshops. Um, so uh, get ready by clicking on questions to see and upvote other people's questions. 
Um, if the chat window isn't accessible for you, you can also email ilc at cbb.com.au and Kirsten will um, have a look at, and post your question. So, have we got any questions there, Kirsten? No, none today. None today. Well, if you do have any questions as Sue and I are chatting, feel free to add them and we'll, we'll, um, we'll answer them. Sue, thank you so much for joining us. That's fine. Um, so, Sue, we've heard earlier about um, some of the learnings that you had in uh, applying for and running your um, ILC grant program with Neighbourhood Links. Um, what did you do in order to get ready for your application? What were the key things that you think helped and what was difficult? Uh, I think it was very new. I think we applied in one of the first rounds. So to some extent, we just had to suck it and see a little bit. And I wish, uh, now I've watched your webinar, I wish I'd seen this beforehand. So it has been really useful because there were some hot tips there that I didn't do. Um, so I think we just decided that the Neighbourhood Links uh, program was too good to lose in an NDIS environment and we had the option of getting a couple of hundred thousand dollars, I think, to support that and to grow it. And so we had a good idea. We knew the program worked. It had been evaluated, so we knew it worked. And this, we saw this as an opportunity, I think, to shore up the program and the organisation. So we were very internally looking um, in terms of applying for the grant and it was new and we just thought this was an opportunity. So how much uh, of that pre-planning work we did, I can say we didn't do it. And I think that might be why, you know, some of it, some of the issues that we've had in our program, which is a bit of um, slow to get momentum and the budget not being quite right, has borne itself out because of that lack of pre-planning. So mm. uh, that's my biggest hot tip is to participate in this program I think because <laughs> I, I, I would have learned a bit more around um, looking at that internal capacity. Mm. So now that you have had the experience of running it if you were to um, apply again or um, you know as the second time round what what would you do um, is there anything specific you'd do differently or that? Um, yes I would yeah. um, I'd certainly front load the budget uh, more with uh, actually doing project management within the budget. Uh, we didn't build, I took too much advantage of our existing org structure. So, I, uh, and that put us under pressure to do that quick implementation. So I would put more money into the budget for project management outside of my existing structure. Um, that would have been really important. Um, and I may not have done it at a time where we were going through that real transition to the NDIS because it was smack bang in the middle of that. Mm. So if I was doing, I feel like I'd be more ready now than I was then because we're through that transition. So putting more money in for project management and getting through the transition, about like choosing a time that was probably better for us in terms of our organisational strengths. Mm. Um, I think that would have been a better hot tip for us as well. Um, and one of the things about getting participants in our program is that up until we went, we got it via the ILC grant, we were getting referrals from Disability SA. And as we know, that's been deconstructed. So I probably would have put more into the budget around how we could actually find people to participate in the program. That's been more difficult mm. um, with the demise of Disability SA. Yeah. So what has been helpful for you in terms of promoting your program and getting those, um, those, those first participants involved? Yes, uh, communication with the LACs has been sort of critical and in particular in growing it down into the Flurio where HCO doesn't have a big footprint. Uh, so the LAC down there has been critical in getting us a pathway into meeting with people. So um, that's been a new relationship, obviously, with the implementation of the NDIS, but finding people has been critical on relationships with the LACs. Mm, great. And um, are there any other um, points that you wanted to make, Sue, or good news stories that have come out of your, your experience? 
Uh, well, the good news story, like today they're interviewing um, as we speak for two new facilitators of two new programs. So whilst the program has been slow to get going, we're now getting the momentum and that's been a, a lot as well about, I take your point about communication with the grant manager. Mm. That's been really critical for us about telling her all the time, we're running a bit behind, we're running a bit behind, can we reuse money, can we look at the money differently? Absolutely, they don't want to give money back, that's a hot tip. They really do want you to succeed, so they're happy for you to you know, rework your project to get the outcomes that you want if you mm. communicate with them really well. Uh, so we're, we're expanding the program as we speak and that's been a really good news story. The other thing that happened for me as well and didn't have a good outcome but it was a couple of hot tips is that I was invited for whatever reason to meet with Minister Prentice, who was the minister oversighting the program at the time. Mm. Uh, what she really liked about our project in that grant round was that it was a physical project as distinct from another online project or another website. So mm. that's a bit of a hot tip in terms of uh, it being um, something that is a deliverable that was really well um thought of by the bureaucracy at the time mm. and they were going to get in contact with us to uh, put some money towards us evaluating our program to roll it out Australia-wide but unfortunately she lost her portfolio shortly after that and we didn't hear from them again. <laughs> but I think communicating with uh, the politicians and things is that is really important. Yeah. The other hot tip for me is, and it's something I need to grapple with, grapple with as well is that this project is now obviously funded for two years how am I going to support this ongoing project because this is an ongoing thing in a project a post project and I probably haven't put enough thought to that yet as either mm. well perhaps there's the opportunity to apply for future rounds because as I understand it the um the future ILC programs will tend to be for an extended period as well yes and the grant manager has mentioned that to me to say they're happy to extend our project uh, guide. Um, you know, it was funded for two years. They're happy to look at it for an, uh, another six months or so because they're understanding that it was slow to get started. So, yep. again, that communication is critical. Um, and also she's saying there might be capacity to refund it if we can argue that it's been of great benefit to the participants in the program. Mm. So that you're exactly right yeah yeah and that face-to-face -face element you know it's also it is a peer support thing that you're doing yes. so that really ticks um that box in terms of recognizing that um people with disability are best placed to um you know guide and shape the sort of support that that um other people with disability are, are provided yep, yeah i agree yeah well, thank you so much, Sue. I'm actually going to get Ellen Schuler to join us now. Um, Dr. Ellen Schuler will be uh, attending our workshops, uh, delivering the workshops along with me. I'll be doing half of them and Ellen will be doing the other half. Um, so, if, uh, so if you had any questions or if any of our listeners had any questions um, about um, the workshops, um, fire away because uh, we, we can answer those now as well. Hello. We don't have any questions. Everyone's very quiet. <laughs> um, so I'll just, um, I guess, give people a bit of an overview. Um, at the workshops that we'll be doing, um, we'll be building on the learning in this webinar series. Uh, the workshops themselves will be an active session where people will be guided through the process of finding an RC project idea and putting together an action plan of what you'll need to do to get it to a stage that's ready to apply for an ILC grant. So hopefully we might see you there, Sue. <laughs> yeah, well, you mo you've motivated me now. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to come to the Murray Bridge one. But I think what you're saying is really important. It would be great to have those challenging questions put to the ideas on the day. Mm. Um, so really, I would have appreciated probably, you know, that um, graph that you put up, uh, that model of deciding whether I've got the internal or needing external. I think if I'd had someone run me through that process early on, I think I would have had a better project. Yeah. Well, that's certainly one of the things that we'll be looking at on the day. Yeah, definitely. So um, 
Ellen, do you want to give people a rundown of um, what they can expect to get out of the workshops? Because there is that um, planning element, like like you said, Sue, that thinking about the capacity and capability, but there's also some design work that we'll be doing too. Well, uh, Meg, we will look at ideas and what sort of projects you could actually address with your ILC grant. Um, you might question, do I really have to come with a set idea to our workshops? And maybe you already have a good idea, already have a good project running, you just want to apply for funding, but maybe you don't have an idea. So we are actually looking at how you can actually explore ideas in your community and uh, how to come up with ideas that have an impact on your community. You will also have the opportunity to meet with others um, who also want to create more com uh, inclusive communities. And we will introduce you to tools in how to design and to plan a good project. Mm. So what, what kind of um, tools would uh, would we be using for design? Well, we're looking at a very simple design approach that you can use to, to design, to plan and also to evaluate your project. You will learn how to develop a theory of change, which is a useful tool for ILC, but it can also be used for any other project uh, to um to change um needs in your community yeah so this is important to know if you are thinking i'm not sure if i'll see is for me or i don't have an idea yet you can still come to this workshop it is free um and uh, we have limited registrations available and they close this friday the 2nd of august um so do hop online at cbb.ilc.com no what am I doing? I've got the wrong thing, Kirsten. It's already on Kirsten's already got it, but I'll read it out. It's cbb.com.au slash ILC and book the workshops. We are going to uh, Wyala, Port Piri, Murray Bridge, Mount Gambia and uh, Smithfield Plains and Norlunga. Have I got them all? Yes. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you'll see either myself or Ellen at those workshops um, and anyone can come. There's um, up to two people maximum. So who, whoever would be leading your project and then anyone else who'd benefit from developing their planning skills is probably a good pick to send on from your um, uh, from your organisation. Um, now, we still don't have any questions for the audience. Did you have another one, Sue? Otherwise, we'll just keep going through our FAQ. No, I'm done. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, one of the um, big questions that we have received about this program is whether people need to go to the workshop to get the free one-to-one -one support that we now have applications open for. Do you want to answer that, Ellen? Well, no, you don't have to. Uh, of course, it's more beneficial if you attend the workshop first. For the one-on-one -on -one support, you really need to have an idea. For the workshop, you can come with an open mind and you can be prepared to learn a lot and to take home an action plan in how to actually plan and design a project. For the one-on-one -on -one support, we hope you already have an idea and you're, you're um, determined to actually apply for an RC grant and we will support you in your planning process. Yeah. So there'll be 20 organisations that will be granted that one-to-one -one support, uh, which will be a, a individually tailored program, including some workshop visits from a consultant um, and some um, support delivered um, as you go through the process of building your project plan. So, um, yeah, do hop onto our uh, website and make sure you register for the workshops and or apply for that free one-to-one -one support. We have one more question. Ah, do we have any update on the ILC grant which closed in March 2019? Thank you, Michelle. Um, I don't yet know. Uh, um, I think you might be talking about the National Information Program, possibly, or the Economic and Community Participation Program. Both of those grants um, uh, have been closed, uh, but they, we're still waiting on hearing the uh, announcement of the winners. So if you sign up to the ILC mailing list um, that the NDIA runs at the link Kirsten posted before, um, they usually will send out an email announcing when that uh, that grant round has been announced. I hope that helps, Michelle. So that's it for questions. If you do have any questions, you can add them at any time to the chat window or email us at ilc at cbb.com.au.
Um, before you leave, please do take a moment to let us know how we did today by answering our poll. A big thank you, Sue, um, from HCO for sharing your time in our Q&A today. And pleasure. <laughs> thank you. And thank, thank you, you to all of you for joining in, sharing your comments and questions. A big thank you to all of our case studies, the Australian Migrant Resource Centre, HCO, the Disability Elders of All Ages, JFY, Julia Far Youth and Purple Orange for sharing their projects and experience with us to share with you today. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you at the workshops. Don't forget to register. Bye-bye. See ya.